Hello and welcome to the tort segment of our video lecture series. Um, if you can please turn to your issue recognition outline and turn to the page that specifies torts. Um, torts is a very big subject on the California bar exam. It is highly tested on both the MBE essays and performance test sections. So you must know your torts. Um, what gets tested? Well, the three big picture areas are negligence, product liability, and defamation, which also crosses over with the privacy torts. There's four privacy torts. Know them well. They will all be covered in an essay approach. Um, you want to also make sure that you know that torts can cross over with a great number of subjects. Um, it has crossed over recently with professional responsibility, civil procedure, remedies, contracts, and criminal law. So you want to make sure that you're always looking out for potential crossovers on a torts essay. Um, you can also get a straight torts essay where you would have no crossovers. So you want to make sure that you really read the call of the question clearly, which will indicate what subject matter is being tested. Um, so I covered just briefly the three big picture areas. What else gets tested? Well, the intentional torts tend to be not an entire essay, but could be obviously a call of the question, like can Dan be held liable for um, assault or battery or intentional infliction of emotional distress? That again would be a specific question on the intentional torts, or it could be something as general as what torts, if any, um, or can Dan be liable for any wrongdoing against Vic? So you want to make sure you really know your intentional torts. Um, there's also these floater miscellaneous torts that tend to get tested, specifically malicious prosecution and abusive process. Whenever you see malicious prosecution, I want you to be thinking if it's also a professional responsibility essay, because that tends to cross over a lot with torts. Um, again, Remember that torts is a big subject and you must know your elements. That is key here. It's, highly, it's a highly elemental subject and whatever you have to do to make sure you know the two or three or four elements per tort, um, you must you know, make a chart for yourself, write it down in a notebook, just constantly be going out, out, over, excuse me, over these elements because they will be ultimately your headings. Um, and I will tell you more as we go on more, especially in your essay approaches, how to handle those torts. So if you can turn now, please, to your torts long outline. Your torts long outline will start with intentional torts. Um, what's key here is to know the elements, as I just said. So for instance, we start with assault. And as you see, your elements will be bolded and underlined. Um, assault is an act by the defendant that creates a reasonable apprehension in the plaintiff of an immediate harmful or offensive touching. Um, and you also have your other considerations, which can come up on either a bar essay or a multiple choice question as well. So do not neglect anything in, within an, a tort and within its supporting considerations. So we just briefly talked about assault. What always tends to come with assault is a battery. So if the threat ever leads to an actual touching, then you have a battery on your hands. So make sure you're always thinking of assault and battery as coming together. The next tort that you must know is false imprisonment. False imprisonment um, is an act or omission by the defendant that confines or restrains the plaintiff in a bounded area. So an act confines or restraints in a bounded area. Those are all three elements necessary to prove false imprisonment. Now, false imprisonment is an issue on a fact pattern or on the MBE. I want you to always consider the potential defense of shopkeeper privilege. Please make a note of it. If you keep going in your long outline, you'll see that intentional infliction of emotional distress is one of the popular intentional torts that a lot of people know about. Um, I want you to think of the privacy torts with intentional infliction of emotional distress as a potential damage, um, as well as negligent infliction of emotional distress. 
Continuing on, we have trespass to land. Now, trespass to land tends to come up also in real property essays as well as remedies. If there is a trespass, I also want you to think of an encroachment, which is a separate tort, and I want you to think of the remedy of nuisance. So if someone is trespassing on your land or if there's an encroachment leaning over into your property, the proper remedy for that is either nuisance or injunctive relief. Okay, so nuisance or injunctive relief as remedies. People miss that all the time and be careful not to neglect your remedies. Now, you'll know if the examiners want remedies by the call of the question. So the call of the question will state something like, can uh, Bob recover against Dan for the trespass to land and any potential remedies? Um, make sure you know your crossover remedies there. We also have trespass to chattels, which is again, uh, combined with conversion a lot. Conversion is the higher level of trespass to chattels. Make sure you know your damage value for both trespass to chattels and conversion. All right, now if you keep going in your torts outline, you are done with your intentional torts, but then you always have to consider your defenses. There's 10 different defenses, consent, self-defense, Defense of others, defense of property, crime prevention, reentry upon land, recapture of chattels, and necessity, as well as qualified privilege and discipline. So you must always consider your defenses, and these are highly tested on the MBE portion as well. What you'll also notice is a lot of your intentional tort defenses are analogous or are the same as your criminal law defenses. So if you've memorized them already for criminal law, they're the same for your intentional tort defenses as well. All right, so key with intentional torts, don't neglect them. They do come up on the essays. They also come up on the MBE. You will definitely see your intentional torts on the MBE portion. Now, we're gonna take a brief moment, and if you'll turn back to assault in your intentional torts outline, I'm going to just show you briefly how you would approach an intentional tort on an essay. There's no need to have an entire essay approach on intentional torts because they really are one to their own. But if it does come up, we're gonna stick to our writing approach. So our first heading, let's say this is for assault, will be Dan for assault. You want to be really fancy, you could put Dan for assault of Bob. And then we give, we skip a line and we give our intro. And what is our intro? Our intro is the introduction of the elements necessary to prove assault. An act by the defendant that creates a reasonable apprehension in the plaintiff of an immediate harmful or offensive touching. So our first heading then after we introduce the elements necessary would be an act. Remember this is an intentional tort, so this is an intentional act. Reasonable apprehension. Let's come up with a rule there and then give a concise analysis why what the defendant did would cause a reasonable apprehension in a normal individual. And then our last element of an offensive or immediate touching. Give a rule and give an analysis. Now, in your intentional torts, especially if it's a racehorse torts question or crossover, you may not have time to break out rule, skip a line, analysis, skip a line, conclusion. So a good rule of thumb would be to condense it in our short form rule plus analysis plus conclusion. And then go on to your next intentional tort. Like I said, assault tends to come with battery, so the next one will likely be battery. Now you don't need to number your intentional torts, but you should be all caps bolded underlined if you're a typer and if you're a writer, all caps underlined um, to signify the next intentional tort that you're gonna be getting into. And remember, always consider your defenses. 
So that concludes our overview of intentional torts. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me over an email. Next, we're going to turn over to negligence. If you can please get out your negligence essay approach. I'll give you a moment to do that. It's in your essay approach for negligence tab. So negligence is definitely one of the most highly tested areas of torts. Um, when torts comes up, negligence almost always comes up. You must know how to approach negligence. Um, now negligence is a pretty straightforward approach. The problem is students mostly get confused within the area of, this area of the special duties. So let's talk now and go into quite a bit of detail into how to approach negligence if it comes up on the bar exam. Now, as you see in your approach, your first heading is negligence of. So you can use this approach every single time. This is all you will need for negligence. Negligence of Dan. Skip a line and you give your intro. You introduce the elements necessary for negligence, which are plaintiff must establish that she is a foreseeable plaintiff owed a duty or a special duty, owed a duty, general duty, or a special duty that the defendant breached, which was the actual and proximate cause of the plaintiff's harm, damages, and no available defenses. Okay, really straightforward introduction. We all know these elements. The problem always becomes the organization. So stick to this organization and you will be fine on a negligence essay. Um, now also remember that sometimes you'll have three or four calls of the question and you may have two negligence answers. Um, so call the question one can be asking you about the negligence of Dan and call the question three again. So I'm going to talk to you about how to approach the second time you get into negligence on the same essay. Now we've introduced our elements. And in line with our introduction, now we're going to headnote them. So if you look at your approach, to whom the duty is owed is your first consideration. Notice that we're not just going right into the definition of general duty or special duty. We're first establishing to whom the duty is owed. Because if the plaintiff is not a foreseeable plaintiff, then it does not matter whether or not, well, let me scratch that. Then the defendant cannot even um, owe that plaintiff a duty. It, it's irrelevant. So to whom the duty is owed is always our first consideration. And what I want you to do here, if you look at your approach, is I want you in a paragraph to introduce, there's our intro paragraph again, the two views. We have the Cardozo view and the Andrews view. Now under the Andrews view, everybody's a foreseeable plaintiff, and under the Cardozo view, it's one within the zone of danger. So you give your intro of the two views. It's a good rule of thumb to just automatically conclude that the plaintiff is a foreseeable plaintiff, therefore under Andrews, since everybody is a foreseeable plaintiff, and then go right into a heading zone of danger under Cardozo. Now this may not be a big analysis. Question mark, you need to ask yourself, is this a major analysis? All right, so now we're establishing that the plaintiff is within the zone of physical danger. You have to establish on the, under the Cardozo view that the plaintiff was within the physical zone of danger and that it was foreseeable. Um, so this will either be a meaty analysis or it may be a very short analysis, depending on the facts. Make sure you look to the facts to determine whether or not the plaintiff was within the zone of danger and whether or not it's something that you really need to go into or can just briefly discuss and move on. Now, You've established at this point, or you should have established, that the plaintiff is owed a duty of care. We don't know what that duty of care is, but we know the defendant owes something to the plaintiff. 
So therefore, our next consideration is automatically our general duty of care. Now we always want to just briefly go into the rule for general duty, but typically on the California bar exam, on an essay for negligence, the general duty is not going to be what's at issue, it's going to be a special duty. So what I want you to do is first define the general duty, give the rule for it, and assuming that there is a special duty, which there likely will be one or more, say however here, however comma here, defendant is a landowner and therefore the special duty owed by landowners will apply, or the special duties owed by landowners will apply. And then you go right into your head note of landowner liability. Now landowner liability is just one of a number of special duties that may arise. So just to be clear and to reiterate, now you're ready to discuss and to develop only what the duty is. We know the plaintiff is owed a duty, but now we have to say what that duty is. It will either be just the straightforward general duty, reasonable, similar, reasonable and prudent person under the same or similar circumstances, or it will be a special duty. And then we're going to give our transition sentence, however here, a special duty arises. And then just go into the head noting of what the special duties are and go into, remember, just why that defendant owes that plaintiff that special duty. We don't have to go into breach, and we don't have to go into whether or not it was reasonable for the defendant to act that way. We're just establishing what the duty is. And then we go into breach. Now before I get into breach, I want you to just refer to your essay approach so we can casually just go over what are some of the main special duties. The most commonly tested one, and again, you're going to head note each one separately, and we're just establishing based on the facts why that special duty applies. Children, professionals, we have different standards for doctors and other professionals. Make sure you only discuss the applicable one. Violation of a statute, negligence per se, remember that that is a special duty because the statute itself is going to list what that duty is. So make sure you know the three-part test of negligence per se. Remember that negligence per se will prove duty and it will prove breach, but it will not prove causation and damages. You must make sure you make a note of that. We have guest and common carriers. Common carriers are highly tested. Owners and occupiers of land, probably one of the most commonly tested areas of special duties. We have trespassers, which are divided into adult and children. We also have licensees and invitees. So all you need to do with these special duties is head note them, give the rule for them, and then establish why the defendant in your particular fact pattern owes that plaintiff that special duty. So we're just, again, to reiterate, we're establishing the special duty. Now, once you've established what the duty is owed, we know to whom it's owed because we've established that the plaintiff is within the zone of danger. Now, even if the plaintiff, again, is not within the zone of danger, you don't stop here. You keep going. You define what the duty is, you establish that, and then you go into breach. Here is your factual analysis. This is where it gets meaty. I want you to use the facts a lot in breach. I want you to really establish why what the defendant did was unreasonable. Why would a reasonable person have not done what the defendant did? did. So here under breach, we're establishing the breach of the duty that we just defined. And we're highly, highly going to use the facts, highly fact intensive. Now, sometimes in questions, the facts are silent as to exactly what the defendant did. 
That's a res ipsa issue. So res ipsa is another way to prove breach. If res ipsa is an issue, you give it a heading, and you go into your three-part test. The accident would not have occurred in the absence of someone's negligence. The event was caused by an instrumentality, underline that word, in the exclusive control of the defendant, and C, plaintiff did not contribute to his or her injuries. Res ipsa liquidor is also highly tested on the MBE. Make sure you know those rules there. Now, after we've introduced the elements of negligence, we've gone into why the plaintiff is owed a duty because he or she was within the zone of danger. We've established what that duty is, either the straightforward general duty or there's likely going to be special duties, probably one or more, and then we get into breach. Then we must establish causation. So under our heading causation, all caps, we then introduce our introductory paragraph, the two types of causation. We have actual and proximate causation, and then each one of them gets a separate heading. So if you look at your approach, you'll see actual causation is when there is only one defendant, and that defendant is the actual cause of plaintiff's injuries, because but for the defendant's acts, the plaintiff would not have been injured. However, I also want you to make a note of the substantial factor test. When there are several defendants, more than one, and they concur to bring about an injury, the substantial factor test will apply, and anyone alone may have been sufficient to bring about the injury. So more than one defendant under actual causation, we're going to consider the substantial factor test. After we've established actual, actual causation, we get into proximate causation. Now, you want to think of proximate causation like a chain of events where the defendant's act directly leads to the plaintiff's injury. If there's a break in that chain, you will have sub-proximate causation issues. And I've listed them here in your approach. So if it's a direct causation, then the defendant is liable for all foreseeable harmful results. But if there's a break in that chain of causation, a break, something else, a gust of wind, an intervening act of God, or somebody else intervening within the defendant's act, then the defendant may or may not be liable. So I want you to consider indirect causation and any subparts, meaning dependent or an independent act, and only discuss the ones that apply. It may not always be at issue, especially if there is that direct causation. I also want you to consider under proximate causation eggshell plaintiff. Remember that plaintiff's pre-existing medical condition is per se foreseeable, okay? You take your plaintiff as you find him or her. So remember the eggshell rule, and if it is an element, if it's, if it's an issue, make it a separate heading under proximate causation and briefly discuss it. It's usually not a major analysis. So you've gone into causation, you've established both actual and proximate, you have two final considerations. Next, you're going to go into damages. Now, damages are usually very brief, and they're just briefly identifying what the plaintiff's personal or property damage is. <coughs> A plaintiff must prove physical or property damage. A plaintiff is entitled to recover, recover all compensatory damages including general damages such as pain and suffering and special damages, which must be specifically pleaded and proven. So you want to make sure that you just briefly establish what the plaintiff's damage is, usually a very short, straightforward analysis. Last, you go into the plaintiff's, any potential defenses of the defendant, not the plaintiff's, but any potential defenses of the defendant. The three defenses are contributory negligence, comparative negligence, and assumption of risk. They may not be at issue, but I want you to separately headnote them and go into every single one. Give the rule and knock it down. Now, 
We're, we're at the end of, of our negligence approach. Just to reiterate, at the end we have our defenses. There's three, and we're going to always separately head note them. Intro, our elements to whom the duty is owed. Make sure you consider the zone of danger. General special duty, breach. Also consider rest ipsa as an issue. In lieu of breach, causation, damages, defenses. Now, that may be the first call or the second call of the question. You may have an additional negligence approach or a negligence answer in a subsequent um, essay or even in another call of the question. So, if you're within the same essay and the third or fourth calls of the question after you've already gone into a full-blown negligence approach, if it calls for another negligence approach, you still keep all your headings, but you don't need to go into full-blown rules again. You don't need to give the whole rule of negligence over again and the whole introductory paragraph again. You just give the heading, so zone of danger, and then you go into the key buzzwords of the rule. You use our short form approach where you do key buzzwords plus analysis facts combined with the key buzzwords to then come up with a sound and correct conclusion. You don't need to waste time, especially because it likely will be a racehorse tort or crossover with something else tort. Question, you don't need to waste time making full-blown rule statements and a full-blown approach again. We can use our short form. The key is keep your headings. That's very important. So that concludes our negligence approach. I want you to also use this approach when you write for negligence, but also refer to the long outline when you're really learning negligence and its supporting elements. Um, there are some additional considerations and additional rules that I want you to always consider with negligence. So make sure that you are referring to your long outline. The next area that I want you to definitely know is strict liability. Um, not strict product liability, but strict liability. Especially in the area of animals, um, you must know the difference between the liability of domestic animals when there are injuries and wild animals and trespassing animals. Um, these issues can come up on an essay or the MBE. Another highly tested area within an essay of strict liability is abnormally dangerous activity. Even when reasonable care is exercised, the activity still creates a foreseeable risk of serious harm and, note that it's not or, and the activity is not a matter of common usage in the community. This is where they get you. Note in the parentheses, it may be dangerous in one location, but not another. They really like to test abnormally, da abnormally dangerous activity from time to time. Um, things like factories where they're doing dangerous uh, activities or like a truck carrying explosives. So I want you to make sure you know this. It could be a call of the question. Make sure you know the elements for abnormally dangerous activity and then the extent of liability you all should sh also should know for both animals and abnormally dangerous activity. Um, strict liability is a pretty small portion. There is strict product liability. Don't get it confused. Um, but you should know the elements and rules there. They do come up. Next, I'd like you to turn to our second biggest area of torts, which is product liability. If you could take out your product liability approach, Now, product liability is probably one of the least favored areas to write of torts, if not the entire bar exam. I think the reason for that is the approach and the organization of a product liability essay can be extremely confusing. However, once you know how to approach the six potential different theories of liability, you should be much more comfortable. And this approach that I have here is really all that you need. You can refer to the long outline for some additional um, considerations, but these rules within this product liability approach should definitely get you through to a passing answer. Now remember that your analysis here is what's going to count as well. So it's not just to be robotic, but you must know how to write for product liability essays as well, so you should practice them. 
If you're having a true problem with these types of essays, let me know and I will assign you more. So, as you see on the first page of your essay approach, there are six different potential theories of liability. Make sure that you make a note that strict product liability is not the only theory of liability. What are the six theories? Well, we have intent, negligence, strict liability, implied warranty, express warranty, and misrepresentation of fact. So the first thing you're going to do is introduce the six theories of liability. And then you're briefly going to state what theories apply in your fact pattern. You only go into the theories that apply to your facts, and that is all. And then you list them and their elements separately. So each theory that applies should be a separate consideration. So going to our essay approach, the first theory of liability is intent. So when you go and you answer, all you have to do is head note intent. Now, intent typically will only come up in the case of a battery. Intent means there was an intent to commit a battery. Now, remember that a battery may not necessarily be an individual doing the touching. On a fact pattern one year, there was an eye cream that a doctor prescribed that ended up infecting the plaintiff's eye because the plaintiff was allergic to it. Um, and the doctor inevitably should, should have done his or her research. So, um, intent it's, is the intent to commit a battery. Now, it's going to be hard to prove intent. It's always, it's always hard to prove intent. But, and it doesn't typically come up, the theory of uh, liability based on intent. But if it does, and if you see that there's a touching of a product to a plaintiff that ultimately injures that plaintiff, I want you to consider intent where the defendant intended the consequences or knew that they were substantially certain to occur. Product liability based on intent are not very common. If intent is present, most likely the tort is battery. Now, who can sue any injured plaintiff? Privity is not required. Damages, compensatory and punitive, and the defenses are those available in the intentional torts um, cases. So, you can go to your intentional tort section of your, of your outline and look at the defenses. Those 10 defenses will apply in an intent theory of liability for product liability. But remember that intent will only typically come up in a battery situation and it's not highly tested. But I still want you to know about it. Next, and you can make a big star is liability based on negligence. Now this varies from our typical negligence approach. So this is how I want you to approach product liability theory based on negligence. Note that ordinary negligence focuses on the acts of the defendant while product liability focuses on the defective product. So that's important, that's an important distinction and that's the key distinction there. Now, how do you approach negligence? And again, this is probably always going to come up in a product liability essay, this theory of liability. Your heading will simply be negligence. This is the approach you should follow every time. First, you establish proper plaintiff. The plaintiff can be anyone within the foreseeable use of the product. So the key is foreseeable use of product. Typically a very straightforward analysis. Why was it foreseeable that the, this particular plaintiff would use this product? Typically a very straightforward approach. Then you go into proper defendant. Proper defendants are manufacturers, product designers, wholesalers and retailers, any one of those four. So very, very straightforward analysis. Determine what the defendant is. The fact pattern will typically tell you that a defendant is a manufacturer or a retailer of a certain good. And then meet this proper defendant. Now, we're going to go into duty. So unlike our ordinary negligence approach where we first would establish foreseeable plaintiff, 
which we've kind of already done with plop, proper plaintiff above. Now we're going to go into duty. I want you to note on your approach that there are different duties owed depending on who the defendant is. There's a duty by manufacturer or design, individual designer, and different special duties of retailers or wholesalers. Make sure you know the specific duties within a negligence product liability approach. And then you're going to go into to whom the duty is owed. So we flip it in a product liability approach. Duty of care above is owed to all foreseeable plaintiffs under Cardozo and Andrews. So here now we're going to establish whom the duty is owed and why the plaintiff was foreseeable. Next we're going to go into breach. To prove breach of duty, the plaintiff must show one, negligent conduct by the defendant leading to two, the supplying of a defective product by the defendant. That's a very important rule. It varies significantly from our ordinary negligence approach. You must know this two-part test for breach and then get into it. And I give you a test on page two of your approach and two exam tips. Read them over and make sure you understand how those could apply. Now it's important to note that on this approach I've given you a lot of considerations and rules. It doesn't mean that all of those, for instance, exam tips are always going to apply but it does mean that they have been tested. So make sure you read them over and understand how you could get into them on an essay. Also note that you can also have a res ipsa issue where the facts are silent as to how the breach occurred. Apply res ipsa if all the following requirements are met and it's the same three-part test as in ordinary negligence. So make sure you just know that test. So we've gone into proper plaintiff, proper defendant, duty, to whom the duty owed, breach, and now we get into causation. The standard negligence analysis for both actual causation and proximate applies to product liability cases based on negligence. So it's the same exact approach as your negligence approach, ordinary negligence approach that we just previously went over. So you go into actual and you go into proximate. Then you get into damages, same exact approach as your ordinary negligence, personal or property damage, and then last we're always going to consider, and these are very important on a product liability approach, your defenses. I want you to separately headnote each defense, contributory negligence, comparative negligence, and assumption of risk. They typically will even apply. Now it's important to also note you have misuse of product as a defense in a product liability negligence theory. Determine whether the plaintiff, plaintiff's property, used the product for, for the intended purpose excuse me, renege. Determine whether the plaintiff properly used the product for the intended purpose. If the misuse is foreseeable, it is a weak defense. So always consider the misuse of the product. That tends to come up a lot in these essays as well on the MBE. Now, it's important to note that Typically, product liability theories of liability, no matter how many you have to discuss, whether it's three, whether it's all six, they tend to be racehorse questions. Um, and you want to make sure that you really assess how much time you're going to give to each one of these issues. I would say if we're under a negligence theory of liability, proper plaintiff and proper defendant are no more than one to two sentences, very straightforward, duty as well what the duty is depending on who the defendant is. To whom the duty is owed, you're just basically establishing that the plaintiff was foreseeable under Cardozo. 
breach is always a meaty analysis. Always, always. Because you're going to be factually describing why that act was unreasonable or not. And then you get into causation, which will also tend to be meaty, especially if there's a proximate causation issue. Damages are very straightforward, typically, and defenses can typically briefly be discussed and brought down, either shot down or supported in a conclusion. And again, you want to always consider misuse of product. So that's your negligence approach in a product liability theory of liability. Now we go on to our sister. They really come together, our strict product liability theory of liability. So strict product liability, 99% of the time this will be a theory at issue. And you simply head note the theory. First consideration, first element, strict duty owed by a commercial supplier. So unlike the different defendants we can have in a negligence theory of liability, this is a strict duty owed by a commercial supplier, manufacturer, retailer, wholesaler, not a casual seller. Casual is the key word. Not a casual seller or supplier of services who places a product on the market which is in a defective condition, unreasonably dangerous to users, consumers, or bystanders. So the key is not a casual seller, not a door-to-door -door, door -door salesperson. That's the key. So strict duty owed. First, we established what that strict duty is based on who the defendant is. Next, product not substantially altered. To hold the commercial supplier strictly liable for a product defect, the product must be expected to and must in fact reach the user or consumer without substantial change in the condition in which it is supplied. That is a key analysis. Next, we get into breach. The plaintiff need not prove the defendant was at fault in selling the, uh, or producing a defective product, only that the product, in fact, was so defective, and this is the key, either by showing a manufacturing defect, a design defect, or an inadequate warning defect. Those three potential defects are the way that you prove breach. This is where so many students get confused. So the way you prove breach with strict product liability is by one out of the three defects. You may only have one, there may only be an inadequate design, or you may have all three. And you go into them. Exam tip, you separately head note each type of defect, you define it, and you go into depth with the ones that apply. So if you look in your approach, I've given you the rule for a manufacturer, design, and inadequate warning defect. You go into all three. I still want you to consider all three on an essay. I want you to head note every single one. Manufacturer defect, inadequate design, design defect. And then just go, but really discuss, really do a full-blown analysis on the ones that apply. Then you get into your causation. Yeah, I know, this is a pretty long one. That's why they test it. Again, causation here is pretty much the same as an ordinary negligence. You have actual and you have proximate. And then you get into damages, which is the same approach as an ordinary negligence. And then last, we have our defenses. Contributory negligence, assumption of risk, comparative negligence. Now, no, contributory negligence is not a defense where plaintiff merely failed to discover the defect or where plaintiff's misuse was reasonably foreseeable. Again, we have misuse of product as a consideration. So that concludes our strict product liability approach.
You really need to outline these elements for yourself and sit with them and really understand how they apply. All right, so we've gone over intent, we've gone over negligence, we've now gone over strict product liability, now express warranty, pretty straightforward. There has to be an affirmation of fact, must be a misrepresentation of a material fact, that's the key, a material fact concerning the character or quality of the product. The rep representation must be made to the public by a label or advertising, and three, there must be justifiable reliance. This is the key. If you don't have justifiable reliance, this theory of liability will not be met. On the representation, which must influence the transaction. Okay, so justifiable reliance is really the key element here, but all you do is separately head note the three required elements. Next, you have your implied warranty. Under this theory, a commercial seller is liable to an ultimate user if the product fails to satisfy the covenant of fitness for intended purpose. If the product fails to live up to either mercantility or fitness for particular use, the warranty is breached and the product is def defective. So first, we consider the mercantility of the product and then we go into the fitness for a particular use. Note that you also have to discuss damages and the defenses here for the implied warranty. And you have some subnotes. Please read through the approach on the implied warranty and really make sure you understand the notes and the exam tip. Last, we have misrepresentation of fact, and it's a four part test. If it is at issue, you simply head note all four parts. Material fact is required intent to induce reliance of particular buyer, justifiable reliance, and causation. Make sure you also consider damages and any defenses. Very important. So that concludes our product liability. The key is we have six theories of potential liability. Each one of them can be tested. Usually it's never going to be just one. Um, I don't want to guarantee that, but it's likely never going to be just one. You will have at least two or three. Again, the most commonly tested ones are negligence, negligence strict liability, and implied warranty, um, express warranty as well. Misrepresentation of fact and intent are the least tested ones, but still know the elements there. For every single theory of liability, you must consider your defenses, and each one of them have separate defenses, so make sure you know them there and separately headnote them. A liability approach or a product liability approach is usually a racehorse question. So really feel comfortable with this approach, issue spotting and writing product liability essays. Again, if you need more practice, let me know and I'll assign you essays. All right? Never be hesitant to ask. Now, if you can refer back to your long outline, We've covered quite a bit with tort so far. Our next big area of torts is defamation, as well as the four privacy torts. So if you can please turn to your defamation essay approach. Now defamation is, is typically a very easy area of torts to write for. The key is knowing how to organize common law defamation with constitutional defamation. So we're always going to start with common law defamation. That's the, these four or five elements necessary for common law defamation are always going to be at issue in a defamation fact pattern or essay answer. So if you turn to your approach, you should all have it out. And your exam tip states, always discuss common law defamation even if you have a matter of public concern. Because, as you know, if you have a matter of public concern, constitutional defamation will also be at issue, but you still have to discuss, you must discuss your common law defamation elements. So very straightforward, your first heading, common law defamation. In order to prove common law defamation, a plaintiff will have to prove, one, a defamatory statement, two, of or concerning the plaintiff, three, a publication, and four, damages. Also consider the absence of any applicable defenses. 
Remember, in a common law case, plaintiff does not have to prove falsity as part of the prima facie case. Rather, a defendant can offer truth of the statement as a defense. That is very important to remember that. So simply, after you've introduced the elements of common law defamation, you're just going to go into each one separately. First, a defamatory statement. Make sure you give your rule here. The statement must tend to adversely affect what? The plaintiff's reputation. That is very crucial. We must have a statement that adversely affects the plaintiff's reputation. And all you have to do there is go into what facts you have that support the affecting of the plaintiff's reputation, a statement made by the defendant that affects that plaintiff's reputation. Two, of or concerning the plaintiff, the plaintiff must establish that a reasonable reader, listener, or viewer would understand, would know that that defamatory statement was made about the plaintiff. There's a note on group defamation. Don't worry about it too much. It has been tested way back in the past, but I still just want you to know about it in case it does come up again. Publication. Defendant must communicate that statement to a third person who understands that it is about the plaintiff. And then you have some notes on publication. Read over them. They are sub-issues that have come up on a defamation exam. Next, you must have damages. The type of damage the plaintiff must prove depends on the type of defamation. So we have libel and we have slander. The written down or printed publication of defamatory language is libel. General damages, a general injury to the plaintiff's reputation are presumed, but the plaintiff may offer actual evidence of damages to increase his or her award. Liable and the damages involved, the presumption of general injury is highly tested on the MBE as well. Liable per se and liable per quad, in a minority of jurisdictions, they distinguish between liable per se, defamatory on its face, or liable per quad, not defamatory on its face, and extrinsic evidence is needed to prove that the statement was damaging to the plaintiff. Only discuss libel per se or per quad if it's at issue. Note that most courts today treat radio and TV programs as libel. Slander. So if it's libel or slander, you just talk about the one that applies. Don't go into both libel and slander. It's either written or spoken. Slander is spoken defamation. The plaintiff must prove special damages unless it is slander per se. Slander per se is highly tested. Defamatory statements that are slander per se are ones that, one, adversely reflect on one's conduct in a business or profession. Two, saying that one has a loathsome disease. Three, one is or was guilty of a crime involving moral turpitude or four, saying that a woman is unchaste. And remember that that's different from promiscuity. Exam tip, if the statement does not involve a matter of public concern, you do not need to discuss the elements of constitutional defamation, and you can go right into either the defenses to def defamation or the privacy torts, which highly cross over here. The privacy torts can be a completely separate call to question where they're specifically asking you for them, or if it's a general defamation question, it may say what torts, if any, or can uh, the defendant be liable for defamation or any other uh, potential liability, and I want you to trigger that triggers the privacy torts. Okay? So, if there is a matter of public concern, you're not done, and now you have to go into constitutional defamation. But I always want you to make a heading constitutional defamation. I want you to introduce the elements of it, okay? And I want you to then knock it down if it does not apply. If there's no matter of public concern, still make a heading constitutional defamation. Discuss that it would apply if there's a matter of public concern. However, here, there is no matter of public concern and therefore it does not apply. If it does apply, then you have to go into these elements. Constitutional defamation, separate heading, all caps, bolded, underlined. <clears throat> Excuse me. When the defamation involves a matter of public concern, 
a plaintiff must prove three additional elements. So you have all the common law elements above you've proven, and now you have three additional elements. First, matter of public concern. Well, constitutional defamation wouldn't apply if we didn't have a matter of public concern. So you first establish why constitutional defamation is applicable. You have a matter of public concern. This is a question of fact. A plaintiff must establish the oral or written statement of the defendant and why it's a matter of public concern. It's typically very straightforward as to why it's a matter of public concern. Something to do with a politician, a sports figure, a celebrity, something that the public is typically involved in or would care about. Falsity of the defamatory statement is your second required element. The plaintiff must prove that the statement was false. Students miss this a lot. It's very important. The statement must be inaccurate. This must be present to be held liable of constitutional defamation. Three, fault on the part of the defendant. The type of fault a plaintiff must prove depends, depends on the plaintiff's status. Don't get confused here. So we have a matter of public concern, falsity of the defamatory statement, and now a level of fault. The level of fault will depend on the status of the plaintiff. If he or she is a public official or figure, malice must be proven. If we have a private actor or a private figure, then negligence must be shown. And you only discuss the one that applies. So if we have a public official, we have malice. Mal if we have a public official, then we have malice. Knowledge that the defamatory statement was false or reckless disregard as to the statement's truth. And you have a number of notes under malice for a public official. Get to know them, understand them. They all have come up as sub-issues under malice. Next, private figure negligence. Only go into which one applies. So if we have a public figure, the level of fault is malice. If it's a private figure, the level of fault is negligence. And you don't have to go into a full-blown negligence approach. The issue is, was the level of reasonableness or carelessness regarding the falsity of the statement? What was the level? How much of it was unreasonable. So that is your constitutional defamation. So you're either going to have a straightforward common law defamation approach, no matter of public concern, where you're just going to briefly talk about constitutional defamation to just knock it down and go right into the defenses of defamation, or you're going to have a full-blown common law defamation, then a constitutional defamation approach, and then the defenses. So we can see how this could be a racehorse towards defamation essay where your, your hand or your fingers will probably hurt a lot but just keep going and if you have this approach down you will be fine so what are the defenses consent we have truth and we have an absolute or a qualified privilege each one of the defenses should be separately head noted and now you are done with your defamation what else do you consider? You always consider whether or not the calls of the question are asking you for one of the four privacy torts. We have the right of privacy. Remember that the right of privacy is a personal right and does not extend to members of family, does not survive the death of a plaintiff, and is not assignable or applicable to corporations. It's a personal right. This is kind of a crossover with constitutional law. So this is a right that you have onto your own. So what are the four privacy torts? Well, we have an, a misappropriation of the plaintiff's picture or name. Celebrities sue on this torts, this, excuse me, this specific tort all the time. It's where the defendant uses a picture or the name of a celebrity for a commercial purpose. So you see all of a sudden your Kim Kardashian and you see your picture on a bus and you never authorized it. Misappropriation of Kim Kardashian's picture or name. Now there is a newsworthy exception within this tort that defendants bring up all the time. So for instance, if Sports Illustrated put a famous person on the cover, it may not be a misappropriation of plaintiff's picture or name. Next, intrusion upon plaintiff's affairs or seclusion. This is also highly tested. This is where a defendant intrudes upon the seclusion or private affairs of another in a way 
that is objectionable to a reasonable person. Excuse me, to a reasonable person. This is kind of a crossover to criminal procedure where we talked about where one has standing. One has standing in areas that are private is what? Where one is, has a reasonable expectation of privacy. Typically, these are not places held out to the public. These are places typically within your own home. So, spying on someone, putting a camera within their home, um, obviously one will have standing for this tort. Photographs taken in public places are not actionable. Now, the fact pattern may tell you of a statute where they are actionable. So that's where you have to read the facts carefully. So the approach just tells you how to go into intrusion upon plaintiff's affair or seclusion. The last two privacy towards publication of facts, placing plaintiff in a false light, highly tested tort. Make sure you know the rules here. And last, public disclosure of private facts about the plaintiff. You need a public disclosure of private facts objectionable to a reasonable person and last not of legitimate public concern and you have a lot of facts and points under these torts make sure you read them and know them now very important you, know, you only discuss the privacy torts that apply by the way but you also at the end of them must discuss causation damages and any applicable defenses so if you have a full-blown defamation essay with the privacy torts you're looking at really hard to really beat it within an hour. You really got to make sure you focus on what are the major issues that you're going to be writing for. So then you have causation, damages, defenses. The defenses are consent and the absolute and qualified privilege for the privacy torts. So that concludes our defamation and privacy tort essay approach. Last, we're going to consider our miscellaneous torts. So if you can go back to your torts long outline, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some sub-torts briefly that could come up and have come up as I, I like to call them the floater torts in a tort essay. They also are tested on the MBE. Do not neglect these torts. So we have intentional misrepresentation and you have your elements bolded and under underlined for you in your outline. No intentional misrepresentation. Also, no negligent misrepresentation. The key with negligent misrepresentation is there won't be that scienter element. There won't be that intent. Now, remember back when I talked about the issue recognition outline for torts, I talked about how torts crosses over with professional responsibility a lot, especially in the area of malicious prosecution. Malici malicious prosecution and abusive process are those floater torts that the examiners like to throw in there every once in a while to kind of throw you off. Know the elements for them. Separately headnote them, introduce the elements, and then discuss each element in a separate headnote. Another floater area is interference with business relations. Make sure that you know the rule with interference with a contract there are two separate torts and you must make sure you know them. Look at your rules in your outline and make sure you know interference with business relations. Now also make a note that if someone is trying to interfere with a contract that you have entered into with another party, you may potentially get injunctive relief because it's a tort. You typically could not get an injunction on a contract situation but this is a tort. It's interfer interference with business relations. So you will be able to potentially get an injunction. So if they're asking you for torts and remedies, the remedy would be injunctive relief here. Now nuisance also comes up in real property. Remember that there's two types of nuisance. If nuisance, nuisance is at issue, introduce both public and private and then go into each one separately. Don't forget your remedies for nuisance, injunction, and the defenses. Very briefly, some other tort issues. We have multiple defendant issues. These are much more tested on the MBEs. They typically do not come up on the essays. Vicarious liability is, again, anywhere that a call of the question asks you can the acts of one party 
then be transferred and one other party, another defendant, be found liable for the acts of that other entity, then vicarious liability is the issue. So definitely know the rules for vicarious liability. They definitely are highly tested, especially employment relationships and independent contractors highly tested in those two areas. So employees and independent contractors. You have survival and wrongful death. This has come up on an essay. Know the very brief rules there. And tortious interference with family relations. That likes to get tested on the MBE. Not too many questions there, but you may see some floater questions. Now we conclude with tort immunities and that's also not very tested, uh, highly tested, excuse me, but it does tend to come up on the MBEs sometimes. I still would know them. Now your torts outline is roughly about 30 pages. That's pretty condensed um, and it really is going to focus on the areas that are tested here. You also have your three main approaches, negligence, product liability, and defamation with the privacy torts. You want to make sure that you really know your elements and you really understand those three approaches. Those are the main areas that can come up in torts. And you also want to know your miscellaneous floater torts as sub-issues. If they do come up, you headnote them. You give the intro for the elements for them, especially with the intentional torts as well. And then you conclude as to which torts of those miscellaneous or intentional torts the defendant can be held liable for. Thank you very much. This concludes our tort section of California Bar Style video series. Please email me with any questions. Thank you.